Okay. All right, we're transitioning now. We're transitioning to what I think We're transitioning now to what I think is um, one of our more optimistic aspects of our class. So we spent a lot of time talking about the challenges. We'll hear more about challenges on our field trip and this and that. But, but you know, we talk a lot about challenges, understandably so, right? We want to understand what the problems are first. If we don't understand there's problems, then we can't fix them. So we sometimes spend, I sometimes spend perhaps more time than maybe I should, pointing out the problems. And sometimes you guys say that really depress you. Right? Sorry. That's not my goal. That's not my goal. Um, you do got to know. But, but um, sometimes this, this endeavor of looking at this management in the coastal zone or wherever can make us feel disempowered or make us feel like we, don't, we can't do something. And so this next, our, our last activity um, for the next few weeks is is partly about addressing that. So to start the conversation here, um, we've not talked about the Magnuson, well, what's now called the Magnuson-Stevenson Act. This is um, fishery regulation. This is modern fishery regulation. So this is a federal act. It's been amended several times, started in the 70s. But the, the take home is at the federal level, in federal waters will manage our fishery resources. Recall, state waters, the, the coast, the, the, the shoreline, excuse me, the shoreline to three nautical miles out, state waters. Or, yeah, right now I'll say that, yeah. And then from there, um, we get into uh, federal, federal territory, federal waters, right? So the immediate fringe is state responsibility, but once we get past that immediate fringe, we get into the feds. And so that, the feds is where the, the federal waters, federal territories, that is the, the focus of Magnus and Stevens. And so this has evolved over the years and we have different things, the so-called, we've talked about ecosystem-based management as opposed to MSY and all these different things. Short version is, this said, it's too, we don't want to be centralized in terms of our planning. We understand that what's going on off the coast of Seattle is probably different than what's going on off the coast of Florida. So we should have these regional approaches, regional um, areas. And so that's what we're looking at here. So each of those, so you see the map of the US and each of those red black stars is one of the so-called fisheries management councils. And that, and, and that given fishery management council is gonna determine how many fish, quotas, size, all that kind of stuff, the, the restrictions on fishing that is gonna occur in that particular uh, region. So we have eight of these regions created by this federal act. And these guys have to create, just like the Native Species Act, the main way they do their stuff is they come up with a plan. They come up with a plan. So these guys, again, just like, um, and, and this was born out of the tradition of individual uh, fish uh, species, uh, individual fish stock management. We've transitioned now into what we call ecosystem-based management, but, but at its core was, hey, what fish do we have in our area? One, two, which fish are we exploiting commercially? Uh, also recreationally, but, but in particular, this is really about the commercial story. And so, um, so okay, so, we're, so what, what fish are problematic? And so anybody can say a fish is problematic. Somebody from the industry can say, a fisherman can say it's problematic. A processor can say it's problematic. We academic scientists can say it's problematic. Anybody can trigger, uh, hey, let's look at this, let's look at this uh, 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 species. And so that would, that would trigger the, the folks on that particular council, the staff, to go and start to gather some data. Okay, so you guys did your senior capstone on this fish? Okay, well, can you please send us the report? Okay, we'll take that, we'll go read it. 
or here's a bunch of, here's a review of the literature, whatever it is. And they'll look at it. And if there's grounds for some concern, then we will start to look at that more closely. That could include um, uh, so-called fisheries independent measures of the fish stock. So not just trusting the landings data, but actually sending maybe our own boat out with our own divers, our own fishermen, and doing our own independent counting of the fish or seeing how long it takes us to fish to get a certain quota or something like that. It could mean doing, again, a, a laboratory-based work in some cases, look at the fecundity of these, whatever it is. So we're gonna, do, we're gonna gather some data. And then, um, and then we, we generate the plan. This is how we're gonna manage this, this fish, right? And you guys have all seen this. You guys have all seen this in terms of, we've talked about, uh, you know, catch, you know, size limits. Now, there's a whole variety of approaches. They all, or virtually all of them, boil down to reducing effort. So it may be we're using a different size hook. It may be we're using a different size net. But in effect, what that's saying is saying we're not going to take, we're going to try to force ourselves to not take as many of these fish out of the population. That could be any fish. That could be um, a reproductively important fish. That could be fish that are not yet sexually mature. It could be, let's wait for these guys to at least have one or a few years of reproduction. There's various ways to do that. It could be with fishing effort. It could be with fishing time, which is another way to control effort. Saying, hey, you can only fish during the month of X or what have you. One of the reasons deadliest catch is is such a and everybody has anybody not has anybody not seen deadliest catch? Lisa, two, three, Ralph, okay, three of you guys. So your assignment is to go Google deadliest catch and watch the first ten minutes of any episode. And you don't need to watch anymore. So that is that is um, based on the consequ that that show which is about these crab fishermen up in Alaska. And that's based on the fact that for that particular management strategy, they've decided, hey, we're going to let people take X tons of our fish fishery out of, the, out of the water. And then we don't care who gets it, right? But once we, re once we reach amount X, we're done. If we reach amount X in one week, we're done for the rest of the year. If it takes us three weeks, Okay, so, just six weeks. so, so it, it doesn't matter. Once we hit that volume, that amount of material removed, those, those number of individuals removed from the population, you are done. And so in that particular case, what that creates is that creates a macho thing, dude, right? I got the fastest boat. I got the hardest, hardcore, mostly dudes, right? And so we're just gonna go out and be men, right? And then because it's Alaska and because people are pushing it really hard, they do stupid stuff, right? They're, they're out when there's a storm coming in. What? No one in their same mind would go out when there's a storm coming in, but these guys are like, oh my God, if we don't go out now, that boat over there might go out and get the last, whatever, you know, 10 tons, and so we're done. So, so there's, different, there's different approaches to limiting our, our take of organisms. And the Fisheries Management Council is the entity ultimately decides very similar to the California Coastal Commission and that when they have a staff and they have professionals like you guys, maybe you guys would go work for one of these, one of these councils, right? So you have these, these sort of technical staff type people, administrative staff type people that might collect the data or might analyze the data, but they don't actually make the decision. They make a recommendation to the voting body, the council, the council is the entity that actually decides, are we going to just completely close this fishery? We're not going to let anybody fish until it recovers? Are we going to you know, change the legal size of the flounder, that you, whatever it is? Okay? And, so, and so the council is made up of, um, of a mix of people. Fishermen, uh, people in the fishing industry, so processors, wholesalers, folks of, of that ilk. Um, and uh, environmental groups could be on there, local NGOs. And sometimes, not all that often, but sometimes actual 
actual real fishery scientists sometimes, although usually not. And so you have these bodies, and they're the ones that vote. So the point is, not all of these folks, and, and most of these folks are not nefarious. I don't want to give that impression. But I'll just say that not everybody is, comes from a science background. Okay. You know, nor should they, but, but just realize this is, not, this is not the scientists up here looking at the models and then saying, oh, we've got to stop this. This is, as with many of the things we've talked about in terms of stakeholder engagement, this is, this is uh, you know, making sure the fisheries community is bought in because you guys have representatives on this body, making sure the environmental community is bought in because they have representatives on this body, et cetera. So this is, this is a good practice in terms of community um, buy-in. Um, once we get to highly technical issues for so-called data poor fisheries where you need to have a bit more expertise in this and that, that's where this maybe gets a little problematic, right? Where you have to sort of be able to understand the predictions of some models and so, so they can be uh, challenging. But that is the, that is the, the and, and we started with these individual fisheries, you know, individual species based management plans and we've switched over the years. Switch to in, in, in another iteration of of the uh, Magnus, one of the amendments, excuse me, to the Magnus and Stevenson Act. So now uh, we do more so-called ecosystem-based management. So instead of managing the the what the Pacific tree fish, we manage the ground fish as a community, right? With the idea being that we want to both manage the fish and the habitat. And, and sort of try to, to manage this as more of a holistic thing. So we've gotten away, by and large, from individual species-based management plans, unless it's something pretty, pretty different, like, like a tuna or something that's pretty distinct. Um, and so, so that, that's, that's the basic federal approach. Not only is that the basic federal approach, that's, that's the very traditional government-based approach that we're used to with a lot of our natural resources. So what, what our next activity is about is, is looking at this in a different way. When, when I used to teach this class years ago, um, I would say, uh, and so when, when I taught this class at, you know, I would talk to, taught this material at UCLA or at Stanford or whatever, I would end my lectures with, or, or you know, and talk about fisheries issues. As, so, okay, so therefore some, some fisheries are, are managed relatively well. Some fisheries are managed poorly. So you should support well-managed fisheries. And so you should eat sustainably harvested food. And everybody would go, uh-huh, okay, cool, great, thanks. And then we did the lecture and everybody go home. So when I came here to Channel Islands, after the first year or two, um, uh, some students said, what the hell is sustainably harvested seafood? And I said, oh, silly student. It's sustainably harvested seafood. And they're like, well, how do you, where do you get that? I said, oh, you just go get it at the store, you know? And they would say, where the hell do you shop? Because I don't, we, don't, we don't see any of that stuff. And we've never seen any, quote, sustainably harvested seafood. So I said, oh, you silly students. There was like five students in the class back then. I was like, oh, you five. People are so silly. You need to open your eyes. Like my son looking for stuff. Like, it's right in front of you. I can't find it. It's right in front of you. So I thought it was one of those things. So again, we'd, we'd, uh, I'd been here a little while at this point. But, but you know, so oh, I'm going to go to the local store. I'm going to find some of this. And went looking around. I'm like, holy crap. I can't find anything. All right. So that started this activity that we're going to be doing. Um, so you guys basically, this was your idea to do this activity. So, um, so in general, at the conceptual level, what we'd like to see when we talk about a food supply that is, that is solid and good and, and sustainable and secure, we'd like to see there's, a, there's, enough, there's enough biomass, there's enough material for us, right? We'd like to, it to be sustainable. So we'd like there not just to be enough right now, but we'd like it to be enough this year, next year, 20 years down the road, etc. We don't want to take the, the amount from the population that would reduce the population's ability to make more of itself. 
Um, we'd like it to be safe. We'd like to know that it doesn't contain a bunch of silly stuff like mercury and jazz like that. Um, we'd like it to be relatively um, uh, insulated. So not just sustainable in terms of the production, but uh, excuse me, in terms of the biomass, the growth, the, the ecological part, but also from any kind of e uh, economic shocks that might come to the system. <coughs> and we'd like it to be uh, legally sound. Right? We've talked about in different areas of the world, sometimes the enforcement isn't so great. We'd like all of our stuff to be legally defensible wherever we are, wherever we are. This is an, this is an idealized, you know, this, is, this is the thing we'd all like to shoot for. Is a SpongeBob SquarePants uh, factor fishy? So on the left, you're seeing a a uh, <clears throat> freezer uh, a, a freezer section at one of our typical um, supermarkets. And the question is, look at all that stuff. There's some stuff there. Are those things are those things um, sustainable? Are those things sound? Did people get them in a in a in a legally in a legally cool way? Is it is it is it? Do we take only a certain amount of those individuals in that population so we're not harming it? There you go. Go ahead, make some purchases. Right. It's hard to tell, right? How do we know? So when I said, when I, what's that? I was going to say, there's an app, Bicot. Oh, okay. Okay, so hold that thought. Hold that thought. There's an app for that. Of course there's an app for that. Right? Of course there's an app for that. So um, the point is, uh, it's, it's not straightforward. It's, it's not necessarily straightforward, right? So my old prompt of, hey, buy, be responsible, buy responsibly. How the hell do we, how do we buy responsibly, right? We need more help. I need more help. You guys need more help with that. So there are people that will, will enter the market because they see, they see a, an opening here. So these guys, uh, I first met these guys at an at a outdoor market up in Northern California several years ago. Um, what they're doing is they were worried about not so much the sustainability, although they're interested in that as well. They've chosen a particular type of tuna, albacore, which doesn't have some of the downsides of our some of the way we've harvested traditional tuna or less likely to have the problem. In the case of albacore, they tend to not school with dolphins. So when people catch these, these, these particular tuna, you're very unlikely to, to hurt dolphins or other, other you know, critters like that. So that's sort of the sustainability part. But what these guys have really honed in on is the stuff in the red and the green up there. What does that say? What's Mercury. 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 So with, which, so with these guys, so <clears throat> something we haven't talked about yet, which we're not going to talk fully today. We'll talk later about this. But, but um, we've, we've mostly talked about seafood as a benefit, right? Oh, seafood's good for me to eat. It's got a lot of omega-3 fatty acids. It's, you know, it's all that kind of good stuff. And generally, that's true. But just like we've been talking about the, the footprint of our species and getting bigger and bigger, so is the footprint of our pollution in our food systems. In the case of these guys, one of the things we've seen is mercury become concentrated as we go up the food chain. And so tuna are, and think tuna, tilefish, really bad, shark, various, various of these top carnivores have a potentially very high level of mercury that might be problematic to you, especially if you're a woman of childbearing age and, and might be pregnant or, or soon be pregnant. Some of these, some of this love, some of the levels of mercury in these um, fish are really problematic. So what these guys have done is they've set up a, a processing facility where every single individual fish that's landed is tested for the amount of mercury in its tissues. So they use it. They got a really early version of a machine that we now have on campus to test mercury. It's super fast. The auto analyzer does it really, really quickly. Emily used it for her capstone. Um, but the, the fact remains, 
So people are responding to this lack of information, but just a little hint, this is not cheap. It's not cheap to test every single individual fish. It's great in the sense that, oh, we know that this is a certain level, right? But that's hard. So, so there are people that are giving more information. It absolutely is the case. But is that available to everybody? And is that information transparent for everybody on every item? Do we know the level of mercury on every single can of tuna or just a select subset of, of the items for sale? So welcome to your activity. Awesome. So what are we going to do? We're going to go see, we're going to go answer this question. Right? So, so, so rather than rely on the federal government, rather than rely on a government body to determine what is sustainable or whatever, what if we flip that on its head? What if we said, you the consumers, you decide. You use your dollar, your, 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 the power of the consumer, to determine what you want to buy and what you don't want to buy. So if something is from some sketch Chinese landings or whatever, don't buy it, right? If something is from a, a place that is either really well managed or is trying to manage better, let's reward those folks by buying their, by, by you know, supporting their business, supporting their fish products, supporting their items, whatever it is, yeah? So that's the basic idea. So the question is, can we? So you guys pass, everybody grab one of these. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna go to some of our local point of sale seafood um, sellers. We'll go to some markets, we'll go to some restaurants. And the overarching question is, can you Lisa, can you Kevin, can you guys walk into whatever it is, the store, the market, the whatever, and exert your economic rights. Can you go in and can you use the market to reward good behavior and avoid supporting uh, irresponsible or less responsible behavior? That's the whole. That's a whole question. Of this activity. That's the whole point of this activity. Can you do that right now? Okay. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to go in and and. We'll go through this. So you guys are going to go to your first one between now and Wednesday, and then Wednesday we're going to enter it and, and do that. But have a look up here. So this is what we're going to do. So we have so what I give it, so we have two different sheets. They're basically very similar. It's a little teeny bit different. We have a, a data sheet for a market and a data sheet for a restaurant. Here's the deal. You guys are going to emulate whoever it is that walks off the street, okay? So you're gonna walk in and you're gonna say, you're not gonna be CSI, right? You're not gonna like go track them down and all. You just wanna know if I walked off the street and I had the inkling to be a, a more responsible seafood purchaser, am I able to be? Am I able to be? So this is what we're gonna do, we're gonna walk in and have a look at this. <clears throat> so in this case, this is our supermarket survey. I've given you guys, <clears throat> excuse me, what I want you to, it's a little easier to start with the restaurant, so you're gonna start with the restaurant, but same basic idea. So um, you guys are gonna fill out some questions. So here, this is what's gonna happen. You're gonna walk in and you're going to, uh, uh, one, ask a, a couple very brief questions, and two, you're gonna enumerate all the seafood items for sale. Okay, that's it. Have a look. So you, so you guys have, we'll have these data sheets, and you're gonna fill out some of the basic stuff. Hey, who, what's your name? 
and um, you know what's the address of the place, et cetera. Let me be clear. We, we have this database that we've been working on for several years. No business is ever identified, ever. So, so I keep track of it just so we, we can know if we visit the same place you know, from year to year and this and that, so we don't double up and things like that. But we never, the purpose of this is not to say you suck restaurant. Similarly, we've gotten a lot of requests from some people to say that they're great. We don't do that either. Okay, so we're not trying to play winners and losers. We're trying to say from a, a, a broader perspective of our society, are we doing a good thing or not a good thing? Okay, so sometimes you might be in somewhere and somebody might ask, hey, what are you doing? And we'll go over what we're doing in a second. But you, um, you totally tell them, I'm doing this class activity with Dr. Anderson, Channel Islands, you know, da, 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 da. But, but it's important just like we, wouldn't, we don't collect any with, with, our, with our opinion poll surveys, we don't write people's names down, right? We, we're, they're, they're anonymous, right? And, that's, and we don't want to know their names. In this case, we actually do know their names. But if anybody asks, we never, ever will publish them. We'll never release them. We'll never talk about them. That's not the point. They're only maintained for logistical, you know, tallying purposes, okay? So this, this address up here is not for... Uh, distribution okay uh, so then it's gonna say day of the week because sometimes we get a lot of fish on some days of the week and some days like Sunday nights you don't get a lot of new fish so that just sort of helps us so what day of the week is it uh, what date did you do it and then what <clears throat> what time of day again using military time so very very simple right it takes a couple seconds all right now we get into the the meat of the issue so let's Let's actually skip the general observations and go to the first one. So in this case, this example I have on the screen, not the one you have in front of you, but the one in front of the screen, you are gonna, con you're gonna talk to the point of sale person. If you're at a market, it's gonna be the fishmonger, the person behind the fish counter. If you're at a restaurant, it's gonna be the wait staff or the person at the cash register or whatever, okay? Because that's who, that's who the general public is gonna encounter, right? Right. So, so okay. So, I'm at a restaurant. Boom. I go sit down. Boom. Here's my table. Okay. And then they're going to want some water. Yes, I want some water. Right. And then all that kind of stuff. And then um, you're going to say, hey, can I ask you a couple quick questions? And you need to use your best judgment. I would not go to the restaurant at Friday at 6 p.m. in the middle of the dinner rush. Right. I mean, they're going to not want to talk to you. Know, it was this weird stuff. Right. So now, not all these things ha have I defined for you yet, so we will, but, but suffice it to say, so you're gonna say, hey, have, are you familiar with MSC? Marine Stewardship Council, we'll talk about that. MSC, Seafood Watch, another uh, pro uh, program from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Seafood Watch, or other guides for selecting sustainable seafood? Right, so as you say, hey, have you heard of MSC or Seafood Watch or any of that kind of stuff? Um, Yes or no? Yes or no? And so they'll say whatever they say. And then, um, okay, great, thanks. Hey, how many of your customers, and usually you have to, you have to give them some, some uh, sideboards on this. So usually I say, in the last week or so, how many of your customers have asked about this? So the question is, how many of your customers have ever asked about sustainable seafood ever? Like any aspect of that? And, and we want to get a relative measure, ideally. I mean, whatever they give you, you're gonna write it down. But ideally, we don't want them to say 10, because what the hell, right? Do they have 20 people that come in a week? Or do they have 1,000 people that come in a week, right? So 10, so we need some kind of, they can say 10, I'm like, okay, and then how many people do you sell to in a day or whatever, right? So we have some relative measure. Okay. Um, and then the next one is, how many people specific, uh, how many people ask about where the seafood comes from? Right, that, that's, that's related to sustainability, but it's also a bit distinct, right? And then same, same thing, they'll give us some, some answer. And then the last one is, hey, with, with anything, whenever we're thinking about any of these seafood items 
on the menu, you know, for sale. What's the most common question? Any question that the customers ask you, what's the most common one they ask? So for example, the, the, the fishmongers, you just say, well, how do I prepare it? You know, what's, what's, what's a good way to cook it or something? That, that, that kind of thing. And whatever they say, just write it down. In an ideal world, you would get two, two independent grabs from that place. In most cases, you can't because there's only one person at the cash register, there's only one fishmonger. But if it's a big place and there's a couple people, try to get a second server's or whoever's input. Um, if you do do that, they have to be independent grabs, just like when we're doing the public opinion polls, right? We don't want to give it to you two guys and have you guys do it side by side, right? We want them to answer uh, independently. Uh, this isn't th this this graphic up here is old. Another another uh, question we have that is on the one that you have in front of you. Um, is any Prop 65 warning signs posted? Who who knows what Prop 65 is? State of California, Senator Cranston. Uh, one of our old state senators uh, uh, passed it years ago. And the idea was, hey, if anything is carcinogenic or mutagenic or anything's toxic, you're supposed to know, right? That's when you go to pump the gas and they have those things. Gas might be toxic. Surprising, right? So that's what Prop 65 warnings are. Um, it's now been determined that some of our species of fish have mercury levels that are at the toxicity level that trigger Prop 65 warnings. Are restaurants supposed to be displaying Prop 65? Yeah. If you sell any item, again, we're not trying to get anybody in trouble, right. so we're not selling go. No, just but, but if someone is selling a fish that is known to have rel elevated levels of mercury that are problematic, they are supposed to have a posting of that. So again, we're not trying to get anybody in trouble, we're just saying, hey, do they, they have this sign? Okay. Next, next, we're gonna. In fact, in fact, what I what I normally do is I normally don't do it in this order. I normally jump down to the stuff at the bottom first. So this is what you do. I'm gonna go on. I'm gonna say, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna note all this stuff. So I'm gonna say what the thing is. Fish tacos. Okay. So fish tacos. I'm gonna write down the price. If there's a bunch of different prices, I'm gonna write down the non a la carte price, right? If it's fish soup, I'm gonna do the fish bowl price, not the fish cup, right? So, so uh, sometimes you have to kind of pick. And then, so so skip this. This is the market. It's a little more in depth. But let, let, look at your look at this bad boy here. So I'm gonna write down dish name. Dish name is fish tacos. Let's say. And then you have to say if it's an appetizer or entree. Generally, because the appetizers are small and the entrees are big, and the entrees have a lot of other things that drive the price up. So uh, it would either be appetizer or a la carte. Like if it was just a single taco kind of thing, I'd probably put that in the appetizer category, right? Okay, going on across. Species. So looking at the menu, what species of fish or, or squid or whatever is it? Okay? So first, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try to fill that stuff all out myself. Go through the menu. Everything. Boop, 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 boop. Right? Price, et cetera. <coughs> And then notice it says fishery location. Where did that fish come from? So that's a salmon, the Atlantic salmon. Okay, Atlantic salmon from where? So I'm gonna fill out all these things. Maybe there's several, right? For all the dishes that are relate to that. And then the things that I don't know, then that's usually when I go to the fishmonger or the, or the wait waitress or whatever. Say, hey, can I ask you a couple quick questions? Yeah, sure. Okay, thanks. So, uh, have you ever heard of MSC, CV, what, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Do that and then go, hey, got a couple of questions. So the fish tacos, what, what, what fish is that? It's the white fish. Okay, what, what kind of white fish? Uh, the one from the sea. Really? Okay. Uh, so so, so what, again, we're not trying to make them feel stupid. We're just trying to say, do they, do they know any information? Sometimes they'll say, God, I don't know. In which case, you guys have to make the call whether you just call it, I don't know, in which case I would put a question mark. If they didn't know, I'd put a question mark in the species. If they didn't know where it came from, fishery location, 
put a question mark in the fishery location. So I know I didn't leave it blank. I know they actually asked and couldn't tell, or nobody could tell me. Um, uh, sometimes she might, the waitress might say, oh, I, don't go, I can go ask the chef, in which case yes. I would say, sure, that'd be great if, if it's not too much trouble, right? Again, that's a reasonable thing, someone walking off the street, if they wanted to know where the Sam was from, to dip, where's it from? And they could go ask whoever. Now, if she comes back and goes, oh, I don't know, then that would be an, an I don't know. Um, okay, and then, and then uh, and so that, that's, what I would, that's what I would note. And then as we look over to the right side, um, a lot of times you guys will probably say, I don't know. And so this last part is how was it caught or how was it certified? In most cases, they'll go, oh, so which case you should say, I don't know. Sometimes they will say things like a modifier, pole caught, or, 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 or some such thing, in which case you could tick that off. Um, uh, the MSC, which is something specific, if you guys got one of those things, there should be an additional number. Again, we're not, we haven't talked about it yet, but, but every MSC item has a unique identifier lot number so that you can track back to where that fish came from, where it, what, how it was processed, all that kind of stuff. If you do get an MSC item, you should try to jot that number down. Cool? And then, and so then I've, I've answered all this and I've done all this at the very last thing, if I look back here, just it says general store comments or, or general restaurant comments. I just write, you know, sentence fragment or two, you know, super popular place or looks really sketch or smells like cheese, you know, whatever, whatever, something that could help us interpret the data down the road when you guys are looking at this, right? Maybe this restaurant's a huge outlier. And you're like, oh my gosh, why is the percentage so high or so low in this restaurant? And that, and that, that would help, help us understand. <clears throat> cool? So that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna do our first one, our first restaurant. You guys can do anywhere except on campus. Can't do campus. You can do, um, what, and oh, also note that with the restaurant, I have it, I have, and I, I have it language used because sometimes we do this in Spanish and whatever, you guys are welcome to do it in Spanish if you want, but most of you guys can do it in English, so just say English. And then um, restaurant category, cheap, mid-range, or expensive. Rarely do you guys go to the expensive restaurants, but you know, still, so, so we'll do your best guess. I sometimes have to adjust that, but do your best guess. And then the cuisine, just what is it? Is it general American? Is it barbecue? Is it sushi? Is it, you know, whatever? Is it a tapas place, what, whatever the fast food, whatever it is. And so that's, and that's, and that's it. And so that's, that's what you're going to do, this first one. So if we ask the waitress or waiter and they go and they go ask the person in the back, and then we go to ask the second person and they say the same thing, or we go ask the person in the back? <clears throat> Sorry, good question. So I would only ask the one person, like the detailed stuff. So the second person, I just asked the, 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 the questions about how many customers ask about seafood and stuff. So I'd ask my wait, my my wait staff person, and if they didn't come back, I wouldn't I wouldn't poke anybody else. So the question now comes up. So I got to go out and eat out tonight, and the answer is you do whatever you want to do. So I'm not saying that you need to go throw down a bunch of money and go to some sushi restaurant or whatever. I mean, well, we we will, we will be surveying various places, but but the point is. Um, you, you can, it, I would use my best judgment. So if I went to a place that had 300 items and I was asking the waitress, hey, can you tell me where all these things take her 10 minutes to write it all down? I would probably buy a taco at least or something, right? I probably wouldn't like stiffer and like, thanks, I'm out of here, right? <laughs> but, but, you know, that's just, that's just respectful and stuff. But, but I'm not saying you guys do not need to go spend a gazillion million dollars and all this stuff. What you do need to do the one criteria for all, I mean, I'm gonna give you guys a list after today. I'm gonna to give you a list of targeted places that I want you to go hit. But um, the only rule for any place we survey is they have to sell at least one seafood item or, or, or a seafood dish. It, it can't be no, if, if there's none, then you then you're, can't do that site. 
So we only write down like the dish that we would order, not necessarily like the whole damn menu. No, you write down every item that is a seafood item. So we do write down the whole damn menu. If there's a lot of stuff, yes. I mean, you're not going to write down the chicken salad. Right. You're not going to write down the beef steak and stuff like that. But if you go to a sushi restaurant, like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. So let me ask you. So let me ask you a question. What do you guys think? What do you think we're gonna find? Okay, so hold on. So let's let, let's jot a couple of these down. So expensive restaurants. Okay, that's a hypothesis. We'll look at that in a second. What else? What else? I think more people are gonna know. You you think more people? Okay, uh, so so um, one we've asked fifteen hundred people or whatever it was this semester, right? One of the questions you guys asked them was, "Hey, when you go to a restaurant, how often do you ask where stuff comes from?" Right? So, well, well, it's more than never, but 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 it, it's it's not super frequent, right? But we have that data in here. We've asked the public now. We're going to go to the store. Look, we're asking how often do your customers ask about this stuff? Yeah, so do you guys think those two things are going to match? No. No. Roughly. I mean, it won't probably never exact, but so you guys don't think it'll match. Mel thinks it will. Brittany thinks it will. Okay. What else? What are some other thoughts or predictions you guys think we're going to find? So uh, the other thing to say is, is um, if someone were, like, like the public opinion poll surveys, if someone were to say, like when you guys went to jury duty and did public opinion poll, they're like, what's up, dude? Do you have yeah. a permit? And you're like, no. So rarely does that happen with, our, um, with these seafood surveys. But there are, but, but with the opinion, public opinion poll studies, it rarely happens. Seafood studies, it's more common. So that should tell you something. Right? To tell you something, if someone is selling you something you're going to put in your body and you're asking questions about, is, what's, where is this from? What is this material I'm putting in my body? And if, if somebody says, hey, I don't want you in my restaurant, you got to take off, I, I want you guys to leave. Like, don't, don't cause a fracas. But that's of note. That should be of note, and that should maybe be of concern. Is that really a place you want to... I'm, I'm not telling you what to do, but, but I, I personally don't know if I would go back to a place that wouldn't even tell me what they're serving me. Yeah, you're the customer. They should, they should bend over backwards for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, there's some, there's some spinning in the back back there. That's where it used to be back in the day. No, I want to hear it. So, Finn, what? you guys think that you shouldn't be able to ask about no, food stuff? Oh, no, I don't feel like you should yeah. come in. No, I'm not talking about this, but you should bend over back. Like, I've had people come in and they're like, this is not on the menu, but I want this. Like, I don't think oh, sure. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Sure, 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 sure. So, um, right. So, now note, unlike, or, or not, not wholly unique, but seafood is really, is really hard to know what these things are, right? So with carrots and broccoli, you're like, damn, I'm eating broccoli, right? Or I'm eating iceberg lettuce as opposed to butter, leaf, whatever the heck, right? Mm -hmm. Seafood, much harder, much harder. <coughs> so we're starting from a point of of much more, 
much more opaque, much harder to get a sense of what's going on. Yeah? Everybody with me? Any other predictions before we, before we go on here? Any other predictions about what you think we might see after, you know, looking at many places? Michael? Well, I think that the place that uh, came to that word is specialized in the fish, I think that place would know a little more seafood. Aha. Okay, good. So, so a seafood uh, distributor or a seafood focused restaurant might be more likely to be able to answer those questions for you. Okay, good. Excellent. Just kind of piggyback on that. Okay. Whether or not they, they, you know, clean the fish there or not, but I think if you were to go to, for instance, a sushi restaurant in town versus Santa Barbara Harbor or Ventura right. Harbor and ask, like, a, a restaurant that's on the harbor, I think they'd be more willing to, they're open about it, more open than... Okay, so people more tightly associated with the docks or, or the area where seafood is landed or produced might be more likely to, to have that information and or willing to share it with you. Who has it? Yeah. So you like, like your Vaughn, you're talking about like Vaughn's kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So Kevin's talking about, um, Kevin's talking about what's the so-called cool laws. So I, don't, I think I have this later on, but anyway. Um, so cool laws, it's capital C, capital O, capital O, capital L. Country of origin labeling laws. This was created because the world changed after 9-11. We can't trust food from these weird places in the world. So your representatives in Congress passed cool laws. I actually started, the movement started in the 90s, but it, but it got going in the early 2000s. Most of the industries were very powerful. Chicken, very powerful. Poultry industry, beef industry, very powerful. They all said, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't want to have cool laws. So they got them delayed. Depends on which industry, depends on what we're talking about, but by 5, 10, 12 years in some cases. Seafood, amazingly unpowerful. So they were not allowed to forestall it. So they, for over a decade now, they've had to report. By they... What I mean is that there are rules here. So if your little fish taco stand on the corner, you don't have to do that. But um, if you essentially are a large seller, and that usually means a large supermarket type thing, you have to, as, as Kevin's saying, you have to say um, where, where the country of origin of that food is. And now again, because of all, we've talked about this, because our data is all based on landings data, that means the country where it was landed. So it could have been caught in the middle of the Pacific, but it might have been landed in, in uh, San Diego. So that would be called product of the USA. So because of that, the larger stores actually do, now not all this, they won't necessarily tell you how it was harvested necessarily, but some of this basic info like geography, they will tell you. They might tell you more. They might say this is like local Californian item or something, but, but um, actually the supermarkets, on average, we know more, at least the, the geographic origin of stuff. That's true. Other, other thoughts before we go on? Other, other, other big, so we, the thought, uh, we had a couple thoughts. We had a thought of the expensive restaurants will be more likely to tell us. Uh, the, the, the specialty of the restaurant might influence how likely they are to tell us. Proximity to harbors or where landings are. Any other ones? Um, for the local area, like Ventura County, does, does it does most of the stuff come in through the harbor? No. I don't want to spoil anything for you, but the answer is no. Yeah, it's not. So that's one of the things we're gonna look at. We're gonna look okay. at that. But that's a good question. Where is this where is this stuff coming from? Okay, so some of the things we can some of the things we can uh, we can ask. We're probably gonna run out of time here. Are, are are as follows. 
So for example, you guys are going to be able to ask about, you know, how, how available is relatively sustainably harvested seafood? We'll talk about how we're going to measure that later, but for now, we talk about how much it costs. You guys, you guys had a suggestion that the more expensive places or, or the more expensive it is, might, it might be more likely to be sustainable or locally harvested or where, et cetera. Um, we'll ask, maybe I'll ask where it comes from. We'll be able to estimate where, um, how much embedded carbon is in your average seafood that you purchase here in Ventura County or Santa Barbara. So same thing, just like our opinion polls, we need, we're need we be doing some surveys in Santa Barbara, some in LA. The majority will probably be from Ventura County, but the idea is we're, we're hitting all three counties again, so we're not just doing it uh, nearby. Your first one can be can be wherever, right? But but um, we're gonna be doing some more. And then uh, the things in brown, we're not, or black, we're not gonna talk about. And then um, knowledge. And so I should say, so th this data, this is some old data, this is an old slide I just grabbed. But this is from our 2007 class. Actually, I did, I used to teach coastal twice a year. Um, and so this is the data from there. So we have, we have a bunch of stuff. So here is a distribution of, uh, this is from the spring 2007 data grab. So you guys have all taken uh, GIS or, or in GIS right now, so this should make sense. So the underlying color is the um, median income from the, the, well, at this time, the, pre, the most recent census. We have another census since then, right? And the idea here is that the darker areas are the more wealthy areas. And so then what I'm showing here is, wait, do I have a, yeah. So I'm showing here is um, the seafood items. And so this is um, uh, the volume of the seafood items. And actually, sorry, th this slide is the proportion sustainable. Proportion that's sustainable. So the larger the circle, the more sustainable. The smaller the circle, the less sustainable. And, the, and without going into more detail, there's no relationship. So this notion that the wealthier neighborhoods have more sustainable seafood does, does not, that doesn't hold up. We don't see that. If we talk about the price of, um, of seafood, um, so in this case, uh, let's see, in this case, why didn't, I didn't label this. What, what, who the hell made this graph? Um, so I believe, um, let's see. I believe the red is, um, in this case, I think the red is the sustainable price. The blue is the non-sustainable price. Not a huge pattern going on. How about, here, let me turn on all these lights. So. Another thing, Zutek, another thing we worry about is when we harvest stuff sustainably, that's hard to do. We can't take as much, many fish. It's going to cost more or whatever. A lot of people think it's going to cost many, many times more. Let's have a look at this. Here's all the seafood. Uh, this is from, what is this? This is, I think, I think this is, again, the 2007. Yeah, spring and fall 2007. And so uh, this is all seafood and then salmon and tuna because it's a little cleaner. When, when we do this analysis, a little cleaner here. Um, so for all seafood, we have a bin in the MSC, and all you need to know right now is that's a third party uh, certification that says this, is, th this meets a certain amount of standard, and this is sustainable. We'll talk about that later. But, but, so this is supposedly a third party guarantee of sustainability. Farm raised, regular wild caught, dolphin safe, dolphin safe, um, just means that uh, it's, a, it's a term that we use for t uh, canned uh, tuna, and it means that we harvested it in a way that was minimally impactful to uh, dolphins um, because of this big uproar that happened in the early 90s that you guys are too young to remember. But, but um, Greenpeace did this huge expose, and they filmed a bunch of people slaughtering a bunch of dolphins, and everybody got angry, and they said, don't eat any tuna ever. So the industry freaked out and self-policed itself, basically, and, and create their own, their own certification for harvesting tuna. So that's what that is. Um, basically, you only, we only really ever see dolphin safe in the market, so you don't really see that typically in restaurants. Uh, and then are there any other descriptor, and I don't know. Okay, so 
Every, every, look at me with this. I know people are getting antsy. No. That's right. So have a look up here. Let's walk through this. So this is how many items were MSC in this data graph? 22. Yeah? How many items were farm raised? 320, et cetera. Okay. And then what percentage of all the items that year were MSC? 1.2%. Not a whole lot, right? How many were farm raised? 18, but almost 20, almost one in five were farm raised. Okay, so that's how we march across. And then this is the mean price per pound. Um, we really, this is, this is an additional thing we do when we do markets. We write the price per pound. We'll get on that when we get to that. So here we go. So the MSC was $13.72 a pound. That seems like a lot, maybe, yeah? yeah. The farm graze was about eight, a little more than eight and a half dollars per pound, yeah? Uh, regular wild caught, 11, and, and on down the road, right? So that, that seems to suggest that MSC is super expensive, right? That's like mul many times. Yeah, you go to that question. Uh, what about, I don't know. Yeah. Why is it, why is it expensive? Why is there a price for, I don't know? Yeah. Oh, because, because we didn't know where that, we didn't know where that no fish came from. So we didn't so know how to harvest it. We kind of like leave that off. Right? So it just like, like fish. So it doesn't mean anything to us anyway. It's like you went to the restaurant and you're like, I'm like, all right, where's this fish come from? And you said, I don't know. And you can write down how much it costs. Oh, you don't know what I see. Like where it came yeah, so these are these are the different these are the different <coughs> methods for how how we how we harvest it or how it's how it's assessed. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And this is this is anything that doesn't fit in any of these other other ones. Other descriptor doesn't mean other. Other descriptor means pole cot. I mean, some of these much more specific things, it's just we don't, it, it, they're so rare, it's not worth having, you know, 20 rows out. So this, if it doesn't fall into anything to the left of my hand, then it goes into I don't know. Yeah? Okay. So right now, it looks like this MSC stuff, this, this third party stuff, is some kind of elitist thing, right? Some Malibu liberal bastard thing, right? <laughs> that doesn't apply to most of us, right? Like flavored <laughs> water and shit, right? Okay. But let's look, at, let's, let's look at some other examples. Salmon. So here we go. Now, now uh, obviously, smaller sample size. Um, and this, again, this is just from the 2007 grab. But here we go. Let's look. Okay, so here's, here's the sample size. What percentage of the total? 3%, a third, half, et cetera. Um, salmon, the MSC is $15 a pound. Cool. But the, the farm race is $9.54 a pound. The regular wild caught is almost twelve dollars a pound. So MSC is still the most expensive, but it's not necessarily. Once we control for taxonomy and once we control for for how it was, how you know the species and how where it comes from and stuff, it's not necessarily massively more expensive, right? It, it is more expensive. MSC is more expensive, but it's not going to be you know seventeen times more expensive or something like that, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, in a sense, you could think of it like that, right? Sort of an additional characterizer, an additional, an additional constraint on how it was produced or how it's how it's grown or whatever. And so, if you do more work, you would presume it would cost a little bit more, right? And I think I think most most people are fine with paying a little bit more, right? <laughs> I think most people say, hey, this is going to be healthier for me. It's not going to kick in my cholesterol. It's not going to give me mercury poisoning. I'll probably pay a little bit more. So the question is, what is the tolerance, right? Do people want to pay 10% more? Maybe. 15% more? I don't know. And then that's where it starts getting questionable. Mike? So, uh, so pretty much if you have it in the first category, would that be the, the MSC? Same? Yeah. So is that pretty much the same fish as the other ones that Oh, it depends. It all depends. So there, there are hundreds of fish that are MSC certified. So some are caught with, with yeah, some are caught with regular, regular uh, seines. Some are caught with fishing lines. It, it, it uh, there's a whole variety of ways it could be caught. It's not one way. So you are pretty much paying more for the same fish, except the way that it was caught is just slightly different. Maybe. So, so, so you're assuming that. 
Yeah, so I have to, I have to give you guys a lecture on MSC. But, but so for example, um, we have some, some lobster fisheries off of Mexico that are MSC certified. It's the same exact species of lobster that we have off the Channel Islands, but our, our species aren't certified. They're harvested the same exact way with, with, with lobster pots and stuff. So in that, in that case, it is the same exact harvest method. The difference is those guys take, you know, well, not, their amount of removal has been deemed sustainable for that local stock. You know what I'm saying? So in some cases, MSC requires you doing different things than you normally would do, right? Different collection methods, different poles, different whatever. In other cases, it, it, it just says that you're, you know, you're, you're taking less of it or, or something of that nature. Shane? Is that only referred to wild-caught fish or is there... Currently, MSC only applies to wild-caught fish. So th th those are discussions uh, will hold, but, but, but I don't want to cut you guys off, but I want to just show you a couple more slides. Okay? Everybody get the idea? Mm -hmm. So you can start to do all this really cool stuff with the data you're going to get, right? And, and this is cool because this is you guys empowering yourselves and empowering our community, right? This isn't some bureaucracy somewhere saying what to buy. It's you guys determining if you guys have the power. Um, okay, so here's another one. Again, this is just from the 2007 data. This is where our Southern California seafood comes from based on our CSUCI data. So here, the arrow, the thickness of the arrow is the volume. The location is hard to tell. The location is a map of the world. So where all these countries are, are where the, I put the name. So you can see where things come from. So, so the USA is the, our largest single supplier of fish. That's mostly, um, that's mostly Alaska. Um, and then you can see the other one. So Canada is pretty big. China is, is fairly big. New Zealand is fairly big. We had a lot of things like hokey and, and, and such species from there. Um, and, then, and then everybody else is, is a much lower, <coughs> excuse me, China and Thailand, and then everybody else is, is relatively much lower. Is that what you guys would have guessed? No? Yeah. You guys are all cat talk, you're ready to go, you're bored, all right. So this is where seafood comes, this is where our seafood in Santa Barbara, Ventura, northern LA counties comes from. Yeah, the size of the arrow is the volume. So the larger the area, arrow, the more stuff we're getting from that location, and then the location is wherever it's coming from. And the length of the arrow is the distance it traveled to get to us. Oh, uh, sorry, the distance based on the landing dock, right? So we never know if this fish was caught out in the middle of the Pacific and the boat motored over here. And I mean, we, we, can't, we can't measure that. But, but of, the, of the distance from the landing location to where we're doing it, that's where it is. So we don't get in. We, I mean, there was a time when the, the North Atlantic provided a lot of our stuff. I guess that, that's not the case anymore. Huh? Not anymore. Well, I mean, that, that would be in the USA. I mean, that, that the, all the USA is together in this, so in this image. Boat, the white fish from not so much. Yeah, Norway is mostly salmon these days. Make sense? Wait, wait, wait. I have a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you said the thickness is the amount of fish? Yes, the volume, okay. yeah. And then how about the different colors? Is that just like a subregion? Yes, correct. So this is Asia. This is um, you know, New Zealand, Australia. This is the South Pacific. This is South America, Antarctica, Africa. We get virtually no fish from Africa. Morocco, sardines basically come from Morocco. Um, do we get fish from Japan? Uh, we, not so much. Really? That's the word. At, at, at least not in our 2007 data. We get a little bit, but not mostly seafood goes to Japan. Yeah. It doesn't typically come out of Japan. So is this data from the surveys from? 2007. This is from 2007. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so he, this again, this is the 2007 data. You can pick out your favorite country if you guys are asking. Oh, there's Japan. Look, Japan. Three items came from Japan that year. So two tenths of a percent came from Japan. How large was the, uh, how large was the sample size? The well, this, this sample size, 1,269 okay. items. That's so weird because that restaurant I told you about last class, they told me it's later fish goes from Japan. Well, we'll find out because we do it this year. So maybe we'll get all the shit out of Japan. That's another theory. How, how big is the Japanese seafood in Ventura County? <laughs> yeah, I'm curious. 
Okay, good. Okay, good. I think the last thing, do I have, do I have my last thing in here? Okay, so the last thing we can do with our data, and then you guys can, can disperse. The last thing we can do with our data is we can actually ask about uh, pollution impacts, environmental impacts, climate change impacts. So here we go. Here's how I calculate that. So this is supermarkets only, restaurants only, all establishments. Remember, supermarkets, because of the cool laws, they, they're, they're more cons there's still unknown things there, but they're more consistently labeled in terms of their country of origin than our random mobile restaurants. Okay? Let's have a look. This is food miles. So I've calculated this as, again, the, the, the most likely place where the fit seafood was landed, okay? And then how it got to here. So this is, this is a bit beyond what we're gonna do in our class, but if you guys are curious, you can talk to me about it. But we have a simple model that we've built based on what it is. So the short version is, if it's sushi, and it was caught in, um, and it was caught in uh, uh, Hawaii, it got here on a 747, it got here on a 767, it got here on a, on a jet, right? If it's, if it's canned salmon from Alaska, guess what? It got here on a train, slow haul train, that went down the coast, et cetera. And so, so we, have, we have the estimates, the, the averages of emissions from all these different transportation methods, and, and they've been put in here. And so from that, we can calculate the amount of energy that was embodied in the average, what is this? This is, I think, I forget what this is. This is, uh, oh yeah, per, per, per pound, sorry, per pound. So this is, this is the average amount of energy per pound, and associated with that is the amount of CO2, VOCs, and NOx from that. So here we go. So, our t so in, in our local stuff, uh, again, this is old data. We'll see this year. We'll see what, it, what you guys find. But so what this says is on average in our supermarkets, our average seafood item came 5,000 kilometers to get to you. That's only possible because we don't fold in the price of carbon right now. Restaurants are a bit better. So restaurants, on average, are getting more locally sourced seafood items, on average, on average. And so this is, this is about 3,800 uh, kilometers. But it takes so much more energy. <laughs> if we talk about emissions, have a look. If we talk about emissions, though, hold on. If we talk about emissions, though, that reverses. So the amount of CO2, the amount of grams of CO2 emitted per pound of seafood in our supermarkets is about uh, 1.2 kilos of CO2 per pound. Wow. But in our restaurants, it's 2.1. That's a lot. Yeah, why? Local boats. Because our local boats are catching a white sea bass and bringing a white sea bass in. The supermarkets are selling a thousand cans of tuna that have been jam-packed into a container, and so on a on a biomass basis, on a on a on a per pound basis, the carbon intensity is much lower on average. So so stuff is is traveling on average a shorter distance to get to us in our restaurants, but is more embodied energy and pollution associated with it. 